generally complacent. So it is nice to see that we had, you know, fairly high um, participation in this. And looking at the demographics, at least in the higher participation, it, it's consistent with our, our census in terms of the bigger uh, demographic. So uh, it tells me that a, a good portion of adults uh, within those two larger demographics did participate. And so, uh, again, people aren't necessarily complacent. It's nice to see. Uh, uh, it is generally good, which, uh, which I, I guess uh, is what I, we've received in the past. It's not to say that we won't pay attention to some of the comments and some of the other suggestions in there and gives us food for thought, but I'm happy to know that most people are, are generally satisfied, if not in some cases we're exceeding their expectations. So good, good job with administration on that. Deputy Mayor Sands. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for this. Uh, I like every year how this comes to us um, with the diagrams and everything like that. It's easy to, to show everything uh, really well. And like Councillor Swab, I think I got through three or four pages so far, um, but uh, it was really nice to, to see the, the overall layout of everything. And also to, to know that, you know, 70% of, uh, of these respondents are, are through social media shows exactly how important that is uh, moving forward as well. So thank you for that. I guess one other thing, I do find that as soon as the survey closes, we, we, I see a lot of comments on social media about certain things that we need to be, you know, either spending more on or spending less. And again, it always tends to be right after the survey closes. And I like to point people uh, that direction. It is, I think, the best way for, for us to understand where mm -hmm. people feel that if, if, if the levels of service are not meeting their expectations, uh, this is this is probably the best way for them to do that. And so uh, uh, I'm not sure how we remedy the people that are missing that, whether that uh, we still leave it open for people's comments or something. I guess we uh, we still have the Black Falls Connect would be the other, would you say that's the other method for people to, to reach town administration? Not, not, not so much Black Falls Connect, that's really a push notification for our, our notifications. Um, yeah, definitely they can email communications at blackfalls.ca and we can uh, tally those, those results up if there's any further comments and present them to you November 1st and 2nd during the budget workshops. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because I know it's difficult. I, 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 I take the risk and I go on a lot of the different social media that uh, I say that's a risk because not so much to read it, it but to, to weigh in on and try and answer people's questions, it's uh, you, get, you get pounced on pretty quickly. So I try not to weigh in on everything. But, you know, a lot of people's expectations these days are that uh, that we pay attention to their comments on these other modes of uh, communication. And it's not easy to do that. So I think uh, it's important that, that we have a, a reliable way for people to, to get their comments heard and seen. So. Thank you. Yeah, Isaac? Yes, I was just going to add, um, we talked today at the director's meeting about um, taking a lot of the information that we are seeing in some of those comments and maybe formulating some frequently asked questions because I know when I went through some of it, there was a lot of um, misunderstanding, I think, from the residents to what is in the responsibility of the town to what's not our responsibility. So I think if we can, um, you know, go through that and put onto our website some frequently asked questions, I think that will also provide a better understanding to our residents of, of as well to what is our responsibility to what isn't. So I, I think that that's one of the good things that also comes out of getting those the comments back from the residents. So would that fall under the service uh, level process that we that we went through? One of the would that be a key metric that we're putting out frequently asked questions? I think that in my a lot of the comments that I see and that I try and answer are just that people just have a fundamental you know lack of understanding about what services that the town provides and then how, how we can pivot, you know, changing. We don't necessarily have the ability uh, every month to, to change 
you know, what our priorities are. So I'm wondering if that would be part of that service level. So I think when we talk about service level, a lot of it does come down to um, being able to communicate with our residents on, you know, what, you know, some of the responsibilities that we have as a municipality. And it's getting ahead of, um, you know, getting ahead of a problem before it becomes a problem, right? So a lot of the misinformation, so we can certainly improve upon the areas of where we're communicating. And then, of course, as we see, maybe we have less um, in the future when we are doing these budget surveys, we're getting fewer responses of misinformation, I guess, then we'll realize that'll be a metric to say that the enhanced communication that we're doing is working. So I don't know if that answers your question, no, but no, I think a lot of the comments that come out of this do, you know, if they're consistently the same questions, that, that, then I think, as you mentioned, we can do the frequently asked questions to try and clarify that. So thank you. Any other comments? So we do have uh, a motion. I'll move that. Oh. Who had it first? Did you have a comment no. first? No. 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 Okay. okay. Councilor Swap. I'll move that council accept the citizen engagement budget 2025 sur survey report as information. Thank you. Debate or discussion on the motion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Councilor Swab. Thank you. Moving on to 6.2. My pen said. The uh, request for decision on bylaw 1316.24, the member at large review panel bylaw for second and third reading. Council, we did look at this bylaw at the September 16th meeting. And uh, this is an item that uh, was one of the action items coming out of the council committee audit. Mm -hmm. I did want to say before we uh, council considers these readings, I know that there was a comment around the amount of work that might need to go into, you know, the additional meetings that may be required for these interviews. And um, I think one thing to note is, um, and it would be up to that member at large review panel. If you are having returning members that are reapplying, I think that can be left up to the committee to determine whether you actually do need to do an interview. So for instance, this year, I think we've got about 10 returning people that have, their terms have expired. If they reapply, then I think you, as the committee, you can determine whether it's necessary or not to interview them. And then that way it'll reduce some of those, the numbers of meetings that you'll need to do uh, to conduct those interviews. So I just wanted to provide you with that feedback. Um, and uh, that's pretty much all that I have to say. We do want to get this bylaw in place prior to October 22nd, the org meeting, because at that time, you, you will we'll be looking for three appointments to the member at large review panel. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, I was one of the people that brought up the concerns about that. And so, um, you know, part of my thought was, should it have a separate budget? But I, I, I think that's something that we won't know how much workload right. it is until we conduct that at least once. So um, we'll, we'll guess we'll play it by ear in the first the first year and people manage their budgets uh, however they can. So that may be a factor in who, who puts right. their name for this. And we'll, we'll also have um, the council remuneration review that will also be that will kind of start up here in the spring so we'll also factor that into this is something new that isn't wasn't that this council wasn't doing previously so that'll be factored in as well so at that time um, you know they'll look at this as saying this is an additional requirement for three members of council so uh, they'll base that on whether there should be an increase to those budgets Okay. Well, the first step would be passing this bylaw. Correct. Uh, now, this would, would be then, because you said there's a bit of a time constraint in terms of designating would, those people would be appointed at the organizational meeting, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. So we, at this point, we just need to get through the readings. Correct. Do we have any questions or comments before we move on to any motion? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Dennis. I move that council give first reading to bylaw. 
1316.24 member at large review panel bylaw as presented. Thank you. Debater discussion. All in favor? Deputy Mayor Sands. Uh, I'll move that council give second reading to bylaw 1316.24 member at large review panel bylaw as presented. Thank you. Debater discussion. All in favor? Unanimous. <clears throat> Councillor Coulter. I'll move the council gives an unanimous <clears throat> consent to move the third reading of bylaw 1316.24 member at large review panel bylaw as presented. Thank you. Debater discussion. All in favor? It's passed. Moving on to third. Councillor Swab. I'll move that council give third reading to bylaw 1316.24 member at large review panel bylaw as presented. Thank you. Debate and discussion on the final reading. All in favor? And that passes unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to 6.3, it's a request for decision on bylaw 1317.24, council procedural amendment bylaw. Good evening and thank you. Um, Council procedural bylaw uh, 1289.23 was giving third reading at the October 24th, 2023 regular council meeting and establishes rules and procedures for governing processes related to council and committee meetings. Um, since this bylaw has been enacted, uh, we have identified minor procedural revision, revisions that have identified or have been identified to clarify and streamline meeting procedures. And as part of the council committee audit process and moving member at large appointment terms to run from January 1st to December 31st, this amending bylaw will remove a member at large appointments at the organizational meeting of council. Um, the proposed amendments um, were outlined in detail at the September 16th standing committee of council meeting where the committee recommended that uh, the amendment bylaw be brought forward to this regular meeting for consideration. Administration is recommending that council give three readings to the council procedural amendment bylaw to expedite streamlining meeting procedures and room, remove that member at large appointments will take place at the organizational meeting of council. Um, and with that, uh, the administrative recommendation is that council consider giving three readings to this bylaw. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I did have one question that, that I'll direct to uh, CEO Isaac. And under the delegation, something that we've run across, even, even this evening where we've added a delegation at the last minute, I wonder if, uh, if you've had experience or what your, your input would be on having uh, an addition in the bylaw that uh, allows a delegation later than the Wednesday uh, at the discretion of the CAO, you know, because it's, we have occasionally had delegations or something that's come up where we would benefit from having someone present. But if we're following our procedural bylaw, I wonder if that's restrictive. I, I think the one danger that we might be encountering is oftentimes, and, and I think it would be up to council um, uh, to kind of determine this is often we may get somebody that comes here that council is now looking to administration to be able to answer some questions. And if we don't have some sort of um, advance information from them, and even if, you know, if it's coming on the Thursday or Friday, it doesn't really give administration time to maybe do our due diligence so I think that that would be the only thing that I would be a bit unsure about is the potential of that, whereas we have a delegation that comes forward and we're all a little bit caught off guard with not really knowing what that delegation is coming for or being in a position to maybe answer questions that may be coming up at that time. Well, I do understand. I think there's actually two risks there. And one was when one would be that people would see in a bylaw that there's a way around this timeline and they would they would want to try and see if they can get discretion. And and the other would be what you're indicating that, that maybe 
administration will be caught off guard. But that's maybe why I want my thought process was that it's at the discretion of the CAO. If it's not something that uh, that the CAO feels would be uh, too difficult to, to to be prepared for, uh, I just want to make sure that we're not. And I, because I believe we have made exceptions. And I think that we're trying to set a procedural bylaw that we're consistent with. So I'm just wondering if it's if there's maybe that's appropriate. But if if, if you don't at this point, I mean, just something to mull over for any future changes, because I feel like we've I, I can think of in the last year that we've had at least one other delegation that didn't have materials, but they provided uh, you know pre made a presentation anyways. So we make exceptions. So there's a few other bylaws that I recall just at the end. There's one little sentence saying at the discretion of the CAO or delegate. What was the rest of council feeling that? <clears throat> Councilor Sands. Yeah, I think um, I, I, my, my opinion is um, the Wednesday before uh, gives pretty much all of us good timing to, to look into, you know, background information on, on what they're bringing to us and and helping us prepare so that so that we can um, we do have questions if we have them we can ask them and same with administration I think to to change that in any way um, like you said um, could 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 put administration off guard um, as well as council um, so and I don't I I, I wouldn't want to say it but these a delegation may may try to take advantage of that um, to say, hey, I forgot to get this in, but I got to come and see you guys, which is understandable, right? It happens, but at the same time, we want to be we want to keep in line with what we're we're setting um, as well because it is important to that we that we get to see these delegations in good time as well. So that's my opinion. Yeah. Well, I know that we're there, there's a lot of other councils, uh, even at our Alberta Muni's conf conference, that uh, are removing their uh, their open forums from their council because that's really challenging when you have someone get up and speak and it catches everybody off guard. And you know, sometimes it's the same people with the same issues over and over again. We don't have that, which uh, you know, and we're not talking about adding that. So, I was just contemplating whether or not there's an opportunity to to find middle ground for people that that uh you know we thursday or friday before but no nope, we've had some fair discussions but Councillor dennis uh, as for tonight that could have been just uh, an addition to the agenda saying that we want to introduce a new staff member it doesn't have to be really a new delegation yeah so so people are it's a staff member that's coming to talk to us like it's different than having public come in yeah, thank you. Uh, we, that was decision made right before trying to figure out what are, where is it that that would fit best in our agenda, and that wouldn't be the example. I'm thinking, uh, I don't want to necessarily put anybody on the spot as to what the other delegation was, but we did make an ex exception. So what I'm trying to avoid for us is if we're opening this up, trying to tighten up this bylaw, and we want to stick to it, we've already diverted from that in the past. Now, just a question from administration. W when we make additions right before um, a council meeting or you know, at the beginning of a council meeting, in some cases, I think that is contrary to the procedural bylaw or uh, is, that, is that under the procedural bylaw that we have the authority to amend our, to add items uh, to our agenda at the beginning or is there certain only certain things that we're permitted to, uh, to add you may add anything as long as it's unanimous okay so maybe that's the case if we did have somebody that we really had to absolutely an administration felt that it would be beneficial for them to present as a delegation we could have a vote on it at the beginning yeah and yeah that's i was just going to say as opposed to it being at the discretion of the cao be I I would not want to be the one because it could be somebody that wants to complain about me. I'm going to say, no, you can't come, right? So I think 
you never want to. So I think it should be more that it could be at the unanimous consent of council. But I think what, what we see happening quite often, as long as we know that they're coming before that Wednesday, we're happy to wait until Wednesday till we get the information. They can still be, uh, it's just that we need to know that it's coming. So we're we're typically pretty, I don't want to say lean, but we'll work. Danielle is mm -hmm. may always, you know, extends that to say, okay, like we're we're not going to print the agenda until Thursday afternoon. It's just that we kind of need to know in advance that they're coming and what they're coming about. So it kind of gives us some context so that if there is any work that we need to do or prepare documentation for council, we can do that. And we also, you know, I think if there was only one meeting a month of council, this might be a bit different, but there's three meetings that a delegation could come to, right? Because we've got the two regular and the standing committees. So there's usually three opportunities out of the month for them to be able to get to us if they couldn't get it in on time. So I think that that's another thing to consider. Thank you. And if I may, it just allows a little bit more time to make sure they have all the information when they're coming to council, our address, um, the adequate, all of Thank that. Thank you. Well, in the end, though, I mean, I, one of the first concerns that, that C.A. Isaac has brought up is has council being put on the spot, or, or sorry, administration being put on the spot. We do that to you all the time, fair to be fair. So, I mean, I guess that's our prerogative as opposed to a delegation. Uh, Councillor Coulter. I, I agree on that delegations should have their information in by the date, but also on the other side, there could be something come up, but it, if it's not, if we're not going to allow it that night with the information we're presented with, that also gives us a right to do that. I agree with CAO Isaac in it's not right to put it on her alone to decide one way or the other. Um, another thing that I just want to say, like a delegate comes and presents to us, but we take their information, we don't make a decision while they're here. So we have more time to review everything, right? So I don't see where there should be a line in there. It's discretionary on if council itself and administration decides to let that person speak. Thank you. I was just looking for everyone's feedback, so I'm getting it. That's it. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sands. I, uh, I just, I agree with uh, CEO Isaac um, with that. I think by respectfully kind of disagreeing with Councillor Coulter, the, when we get the, the information from the delegation um, on the Friday, we, I, I think a, a lot some people may not understand that we get these um, these agenda packages on the Friday. So that gives us the weekend, which we pretty much spend all weekend reviewing this stuff. Um, and so with the information from the delegation that we might get, um, we spend a lot of time on that so that when they do come in on Tuesday for that meeting, um, we do have background information on them on 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 what whichever topic they're bringing to us and we have questions that that we want answered um unless we are understanding this and they can bring that but if they don't and we don't have that that time and they don't bring all their information that that maybe is needed makes it very difficult because we don't have to make a decision but we do have to understand what they're what they're bringing to us and for us to to be spending a weekend looking through all this um but not having all that information um it might it might blindside us in, in a way too because we we want to make sure that we have all the information that they want to to pass along to us um for that so uh that's just my opinion Councillor Coulter. I respect your opinion and I agree with your opinion. I just want to point out as well as we have had delegations submit a form 
that had no information to it on what was happening, right? So, but I, with this bylaw, I don't see where we need to add that spot in unless it becomes a real problem, like having, well, one that didn't need to be actually a doubt. Um, Another guess, yeah. Right? So it over... I think with year. our consent agenda, we've we've removed you know the information section where we would have typically seen this before. Uh, so it is under the consent agenda. I was if so, it's a different structure that we're getting accustomed to. Where do we fit in uh, someone that's on the spot wanting to present orally to council that may or may not be uh, our administration, but. I don't want to overcomplicate this. I thought maybe that there was uh, we would we would just be ensuring that we're following our procedures, but we we occasionally do stray from that by just like we did this evening, adding something to the agenda. So I think we've had pretty good conversation about it. I don't want to overcomplicate a procedure, but uh, council, as we kind of clarified, council has the discretion at the beginning of the meeting if there were a pressing issue that we feel someone would be presenting. Uh, and administration is not uh, indicating that they're not prepared for it, then we have the discretion to add that at the beginning of the meeting. So that doesn't go against the procedural bylaw. And that same goes for any business items as any well. Any business items, yeah. Just essentially anything on the agenda is open as long as there's a majority vote of council. Mm -hmm. and delegation and presentation, they fall under the same category. So you'll notice in the standing committee, it'll say presentations. It's, it's more or less under the same category. Okay. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. We're always trying to strive to be a little bit more uh, adherent to our bylaws. And this is, we're, we're amending this bylaw to be consistent with, well, what is it MGA that, uh, that dictated this again? Uh, well, the changing of public hearings before um, delegations is just so when we're advertising for public hearings that we're, following the time right um because sometimes with delegations it can take you right know, fair enough we don't want a 40 minute delegation before the public hearing correct right okay thank you so we do have the th we do have recommended motions which involve the the readings and the recommendation to go to 30 uh, council dennis i'll move that council give first reading to bylaw 1317.24 council procedural amendment bylaw as presented Thank you. Debate or discussion? All in favor? Hearing pass. Councillor Coulter? I'll move the council give second reading to bylaw 1317.24, council procedural amendment bylaw as presented. Thank you. Debate, discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Deputy Mayor Sands? Uh, I'll move that council give unanimous consent to move to third reading of bylaw 1317.24, council procedural amendment bylaw as presented. Thank you. Debate or discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. So we can move to third final reading. Councillor Swab. I'll move that council give third reading to bylaw 1317.24, council procedural amendment bylaw as presented. Thank you. Debate, discussion? All in favor, and that's unanimous, thank you. Thank you. And moving on to 6.4, uh, request for decision on the audit services RFP award. Director DeBresser. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so before you, you do have our RFP results from uh, the audit services. <clears throat> uh, the town's current auditors, BDO Canada Limited, gave 90 days notice for termination of our current contract. The auditing services um, um, got terminated as they were unable to maintain their negotiated rate of $25,000 per year. Uh, Section 280 of the MGA required, requires the town to appoint auditors, or one, or more, one or more auditors for the municipality. The current purchasing policy directs administration to release a request for proposal as it's a multi-year contract with expected value over uh, 100,000. The town increased increase the scope of the RFP to include five years as it assists the auditors becoming more knowledgeable of our operations and working procedures. 
Uh, the RFP was released on September 13th with the following criteria, uh, experience and expertise, 25%, um, experience servicing clients, uh, including the company and staff, which are 25 references were 10% and fee structures with clear allocation of cost 40%, making up a total of 100%. The town received a total of six submissions as listed below. I won't go through them. Uh, each administrative review committee member independently rated all their submissions and the proponents were awarded uh, overall average of each criteria. Uh, the committee reviewed considerations and valuation upon the, and then followed up on references. The range of bids was vastly different from each submission. However, the committee members reached the consensus with the firm representing the town's interest um, of a thorough audit at a competitive price. The town's previous budget was $25,000 for audit services and $6,500 tri-annual audit for the local authority's pension plan. In 2026, the annual budgets uh, have been modified uh, as indexed um, out outlined below in the, in the proposal from Matrix Group, ranging from $34,000 to $39,000 for the financial audit and $4,500 for the LAPP audit. So uh, there's two motions for council to consider that uh, council award the five year contract for audit services to metrics group LLP. And then the second one there that the council appoint metrics group LLP as auditors for the town of Black Falls for the period of 2024 to 2028. And with that, I'll open up for any questions. Thank you. Questions, comments. I know in this case, this is a very administrative duty that uh, I don't think uh, most of council uh, would want to be involved in, let alone uh, is able to be involved in. So I, I'm happy to default to, to, you know, when administration is most comfortable with an auditor, uh, is that the expectation is that, uh, that the process will go smoothly and, 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 that's, uh, and I'm comfortable with that. So I'm uh, happy to support administrative recommendation. Deputy Mayor Sands. If no one else has any comments, uh, I'm prepared to move. The council award the five-year contract for audit services to Metrics Group, LLP. Thank you. Debate or discussion on the motion? All in favor? That is unanimous. Councillor Schwab. I'll move that council appoint Matrix Group LLP as auditors for the town of Black Falls for the period of 2024 to 2028. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? And that's unanimous as well. Thank you. And moving on to 6.5 uh, Atco Gas and Fortis Alberta franchise fees. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Council, again. So before you, you do have a document on the Atco Gas and Fortis Alberta franchise fees. Uh, the franchise fee agreements uh, permit the utility companies, Fortis Alberta and Echo Gas, to be the sole natural gas and electricity distrib distributors within the town's boundaries. This agreement allows the town to recover franchise fees from granting the utility right-of-ways um, and roadways for the distribution infrastructure as a percentage of delivery revenue. The maximum allowable rates regulated by the Alberta Utilities Commission is 35% for gas and 20% for electricity. Each year, Fortis and ATCO send letters to municipalities indicating the estimated delivery revenue and franchise fee for the upcoming year. These amounts are inputted into the annual budget and then in turn transferred to our general capital reserve. These amounts have no impact on the operating budget. However, the revenue is vital in funding our five-year capital plan. The province of Alberta introduced the Utilities Affordability uh, Amendment Act, which requires the town to have ATCO franchise agreements reviewed and reapproved by the Alberta Utilities Commission. To do this, uh, the town was required to advertise notice in the lo local newspaper with the widest circulation um, in our community. Advertising was made in the Lacombe Express on September 19th, 2024. Feedback was due on and before October 3rd and the re town received no feedback from the public. Fortis Alberta was excluded from this um, process. Through the capital budget process, the funds from franchise fees have been used in the past for the following projects. Uh, annual trail development, accelerated to, uh, to payments for debentures, um, that was the Abbey Center from last year, mobile equipment reserves, so the vehicles and heavy equipment, uh, building improvements, the lower civic renovations was one of them, and various road improvements. Uh, the, uh, the town collects uh, the following amounts annually. So ATCO uh, is just under uh, 980,000 and Fortis is just $1.1 million. 
The administration recommends keeping the current rates for both natural gas and electricity at 35% and 20% respectively. Should council decide to change the percentage charge, administration would have to advertise in the local paper, having the wider circulation within the community for two consecutive weeks. Advertise, um, the advertisement would include contact information to allow residents to comment or ask questions. So uh, the admin recommendation tonight is that council hold the 2025 natural gas, which is ATCO gas franchise fee for the town of Black Falls at the current rate of 35%. And that council hold the 2025 uh, electricity for this Alberta franchise fee for the town of Black Falls at the current rate of 20%. And with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you. I think basic one is that this is the maximum, correct? In both correct. cases? Okay. And I guess another question I would have when, when, when the, the AUC required the uh, ATCO agreement to be renewed, um, did that essentially open it up to other providers or is there even other providers that are capable of doing it? The infrastructure is owned by ATCO and that would be the case I would say with Bordis as that, well. That's correct. Right? Yeah. The franchise fee agreements that were signed, I think there were a 10 or a 15 year agreement. I can't remember when they got last got signed. Uh, a couple of years ago. So we're, we're in a long term, um, but yeah, that gives the rights to it, both ATCO and Porters. The um, the reason why the province be, uh, implemented this act was other municipalities, that some larger implement, were implementing a rider on Baba the distribution fees as well. So they were kind of double diffing. So that's why that everything has to get renewed and get a reapproval from uh, ATCO gas. There were some, some other things going on at other municipalities that the province had to crack down on. Okay. Uh, for example, yes, um, I'll, I'll just reference uh, Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, I don't have figures there, but it was vastly different on the actual gas distribution uh, franchise fees for both of those. I think Calgary was over over Edmonton by about 160 million. Um, so it was subst substantial. So um, this this brought on the process of all munis municipalities having to get reapproved. Okay, thank you. So essentially, the only option that we have in this whole process is to take less franchise fee. That's correct, yeah. And there's a whole process behind that. Um, but yeah, I just want improvements. So um, other municipalities do use them for operations. So they are funding operations with these franchise fees. But um, we, we as an organization, hold them in, in capital. So Yes, thank you. And given the fact that the community continues to grow, uh, you know, it, it's necessary for us to, to di direct a, a fairly substantial amount towards new infrastructure correct. and improved infrastructure. Thank you. All right, so we don't have a lot of leeway in this one. Our only other option would be to consider less franchise fee, which, yeah, I'm not sure that that's the direction anyone's going. All right, thank you. Deputy Mayor Sands. Uh, I'm prepared to move uh, that council hold the 2025 natural gas franchise fee for the town of Blackfolds at the current rate of 35%. <clears throat> thank you, debater discussion. All in favor, thank you. It's unanimous. Councillor Coulter. I move the council holds the 2025 Electrical Forest Alberta franchise fees for the town of Black Falls at the current rate of 20%. Thank you, debate and discussion. All in favor, that passes unanimously as well, thank you. Um, business item 6.6, .6, the Black Falls Crossing Sanitary Trunk Project Budget Amendment Request. Director Wern. Thank you, Worship Council. Uh, so tonight we're talking about the Black Falls Crossing Sanitary Trunk. Uh, I'm happy to uh, report that the casing has been uh, punched through the CP Rail KC right of way, and uh, they successfully completed the mandrel testing today. So the next step in that process will be to thread the large HDP pipe through the con or through the steel uh, underneath the highway or the railway, and then uh, tie in the manholes. Uh, so the project is going well. Uh, we originally approved the uh, 2023 capital budget to include $2.65 million for the sanitary trunk project. And since that time, we have awarded that contract to Bother Construction. 
Uh, the sanitary trunk project includes the augering under the CP Rail KC line that I just talked about, uh, the continuation of the sewer trunk west of the dog park to the southern side of Black Falls Crossing Way uh, by the new Wendy's there. And then uh, that's where the line is connected uh, to the existing sanitary crossing at Highway 2A and further goes into the uh, uh, regional uh, wastewater pumping system that goes back to the city of Red Deer. Uh, so with this project, we did require and is, are still closing South Street to complete the augering. And uh, just an update on this, uh, Bother has been doing an amazing job building this project for the town and the county. They're extremely efficient and flexible with the project as a whole. However, the project has experienced some uh, major scheduling delays due to the availability of CPKC flaggers. Uh, so that's the CP rail flaggers that are needed on site uh, while the work is being done. So this has resulted uh, in a request from the contractors to be compensated fairly for the nine day delay. Uh, this is about uh, a total of $152,500. Uh, further extra efforts were required along the, the way to retrofit and replace a large manhole in the existing underground system. Um, other items of note included additional settlement monitoring program cost increase, as well as uh, improved safety protection on the two deep manhole connections. Uh, there was also excessive uh, thrust block removal of the old system and additional efforts to remove, required to remove the actual existing manhole that we had to replace where we originally thought we were going to be able to reuse it. A large manhole has been ordered and we are awaiting delivery. Uh, this work totals about $78,000. Uh, so once we move forward with the uh, change orders, uh, this is going to result in us basically eating through the remaining contingency of about uh, $200,000. Uh, so what we're asking tonight is that uh, you consider amending the budget. Um, we're concerned that any additional changes will be unfunded. So for instance, if we run into unsuitable material uh, or shrinkage on the east side, um, or if any other items arise. Uh, so it'd be prudent if we uh, kept a additional contingency after we've gone through this contingency, which has already basically been paid for, or has already been basically used up. Uh, so we, we anticipate that another $100,000 should be earmarked for this uh, additional unknown changes or uh, unknowns at this point. Uh, so attached was a spreadsheet kind of outlining the uh, budget to date. So right, right now we have an approved budget of $2.65 million. And uh, with the work that we've already had to expend the money on uh, for the delays, as well as uh, for all the miscellaneous items, uh, we're at a $254,000 um, line item, which basically eats up the contingency. So what we're asking for is an additional $100,000. So the new total budget approved, sorry, $103,510, So the total budget if approved would be $2.753,511. And that would be revised based off of the cost sharing agreement we have with the county. Uh, so we're pretty hopeful that the county uh, will uh, help us amend the agreement and uh, Lacombe County has been made aware of the fact that we are uh, at budget at this time on this project. Uh, so financial implications, Lacombe County will provide 48% of the project with the remaining portion of the additional request of 52% uh, to be covered through the town's wastewater and offsite levies and also wastewater reserve. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to any questions and uh, our administrative recommendation is to uh, allow that revision to happen, increase the budget to $103,511 for the Black Falls Sanitary Trunk Project. Uh, so that would be a total budget of 2.753,511. Thank you. Comments, questions? Councillor Coulter. Um, Director Warren, I just have a quick question. So. With the season coming up where it's going to get really cold, are we going to have this nine or more day delay with the um, flag people? Or once the pipes put underneath, are we done with them? Uh, yeah, Councillor Culture, thank, thank you for that question. So with the pipe already being under the roadway, 
Uh, there's a couple of more days of testing and then they'll have to thread the pipe through there. Uh, but we have been getting very good commitment from CPKC flaggers after the long weekend that impacted that nine day delay. So I'm pretty confident going forward, uh, CPKC flaggers have been working with us. And then too, we only have about uh, probably a week or two of going under the railway and then we'll be done that work and we won't need any more flaggers. So the risk is low. Councilor Schwab. Through the chair to Director Warren, um, I'm glad that the CPKC flaggers will be actually coming out to do their job. I'm just wondering though, do they understand how much this is costing our municipality from the nine day delay? Because now we have to tell our residents that we're forking out another $152,576. But I think they should be educated on like, this is what's happening to our community because they didn't have people in place to do their job. Yeah, for sure, Councillor Swab. Um, we can definitely re relay that message to John's and CPKC, um, but they actually have a very tight turnaround for their flaggers. So um, it's basically a week time from each week they've got to go out for um, a request for their flaggers to bid on the job. So it's kind of more of an internal CPKC concern. And obviously these big projects like that, that's going to be the biggest impact. Um, we were lucky enough that Bother was really flexible with their time frame and was, was able to work on the east side. But we can definitely relay that message on to CP Rail if you would like us to. I think that they should understand like what it's costing us to because of it. And maybe in other projects that they have with other municipalities, it, this kind of thing may not happen to their municipalities that happen to ours. I don't know because I don't know how much staff they have, but it's just frustrating that we have to Very work out a little bit more money. Deputy Mayor Sands. Uh, thank you. Um, through the chair to Director Warren, I was just wondering, was this a, a, a scheduling problem on our end or was it just a, um, a scheduling problem as a result of their stop work or, or anything related to that? I'm just wondering, I just know if I was nine days late for a job, I wouldn't have one anymore. Um, you know, so I'm just wondering, like Councillor Swab said, it'd be it'd be nice to, to see what they might say to that, to, to, you know, I mean, for some people that amount of money, for some municipalities, that's not a lot of money. But when you, in the grand scheme of things, it is a lot of money. And so I was just wondering, is was it a result of scheduling or uh, did something fall behind or? or? So, yeah, uh, thank you for that question, Councillor Sands. So it was a scheduling thing. And also we had to pre-apply for the flagging. So we had to give like a 30 day notice. And so we did that. And then we got the flagging um, area of CPKC involved. And then that's when they kind of told us there was really strict requirements around the turnaround period and they couldn't guarantee any of those flagging times. So we were kind of at the mercy of them, um, but we were kind of anticipating a little bit better um, turnaround time from CPKC. And then too, right. you're coordinating a lot of other consultants as well too. So they've got a consultant that they have to have on the site. Mm -hmm. And then there's also geotechnical on our side and survey on our side. So yeah, it was definitely a, um, a perfect storm which led to this delay. And like I said, it was, the, uh, Bother could have provided us a lot more, I think, costs that probably would have been fair, but they definitely realized the fact that it was kind of beyond our control as well too. So they really worked with us to get that prepared. Right, right. Yeah, and thank, thankful, I'm thankful to them that they're that they're uh, doing what they're doing there. So um, it'd be interesting uh, to see what uh, CPKC has to say about that um, when you know we're at their mercy um, and it ultimately comes out of our pockets. So, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we've had a lot of projects that uh, involve CP over the last few years and we've learned that 
they're a very, very big organization and our projects are barely on their, uh, on their radar, unfortunately, for the number of things that they have to deal with. So we're a little bit up in mercy, as you pointed out. Uh, and just so I'm understanding this, this increase, is these, are these actual overruns or is this an upset amount on the budget for, for potential overruns at this point? Your Worship, uh, the $3,511 is actual overruns to finish off this change order. And then the remaining $100,000 would be earmarked if we need to use it okay. as contingency. Upset contingency amount. Yes. Okay, so potentially we won't necessarily utilize it. Correct. Potentially. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We do have uh, administrative recommendation. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Sands. Uh, I'm prepared to move that council approve the budget increase of $103,511 for the Black Falls Crossing Sanitary Trunk Project budget for a total budget of $2,753,000. $511 to pay for the delays, miscellaneous items, and allocate additional contract contingencies. Thank you. Greater discussion? I will just comment that uh, this project uh, has, you know, come, come to us because of the growth in uh, the county in particular. And there's a lot of upside to this, uh, upsizing of this line that, uh, will in the long run benefit Black Falls. So, I, I mean, I think it's important that uh, despite the fact that it's a little more than we anticipated that, the, that we get this project done because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of upside to the community uh, from tax revenue from the, uh, from the uh, joint economic area. So I definitely support getting this done as quickly as possible. So I call the question, all in favor? And that uh, it passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Uh, we could do, uh, just since you're up there, we can do the, well, we'll just jump to 6.8 and do the uh, road construction update while you're up there. Yeah, great. Thank you, uh, Your Worship Council. Uh, so I just wanted to bring forward a verbal update on uh, some of the roads projects that are happening. Uh, we briefly talked about the sanitary uh, Black Falls Crossing project. So with that road closure there, um, they do anticipate that the large manhole uh, that's on order to go back into that hole uh, will be arriving here soon. Um, but with that will come the backfill and the connection there. Um, so we're actually probably not going to be able to pave that road before the end of the year, uh, but it will be opened as a gravel cross section around November 11th based off of the contractor's current schedule. Uh, so that's the update on the South Street uh, CP rail crossing. And then if we go east across the tracks, uh, there is the uh, 2024 asphalt overlay program. Uh, so the two patches over in the downtown and across Highway 2A are completed. Um, the east rail asphalt overlay is completed along with the sidewalk and everything there. The only part of that that's remaining is the crossing itself. So the uh, three meter asphalt path that we're going to put across that uh, location where it's closed right now. CPKC was out on site today uh, starting to install the um, aprons that are needed to be able to put that crosswalk across the north side of South Street. So that's very positive news. Um, we're hoping that they can get that work done and then we're hoping that uh, the pavement can happen in that area. Uh, that being said, the area directly north of the large hole so between Westridge extension and the CP rail line, more than likely that portion of that trail won't get put in as asphalt just because of the time delays. So they can't work right by that hole essentially because it'll slough in if they do. Uh, so that work will probably be pushed back to the following year, but the gravels and everything should be done. Uh, so we wanna make it as accessible as possible through the winter so we're doing our best to hit that as far as the young road project so all the um sanitary or sorry all the stormwater underground piping has been put in at the football field uh the north end of the project is fully concreted in as of today uh, they'll be grading the road on the north end and probably paving it in about a week week and a half depending on when they finish the other um concrete panels that are somewhat outstanding there uh, and then they need a week to it for it to dry 
On the south end of the project, they have completed the first lift of the uh, roadway there in its entirety. So Leung should be open in a couple days as soon as they do the paint marking. So uh, that's the update for the majority of the projects. Uh, the Vista Trail uh, asphalt project that was part of the condo work uh, is still outstanding. I believe they're going to be paving here in the next couple of weeks. We do have that kind of hard deadline of uh, October 31st when the paving companies uh, start, shut down their plants. They do keep them open every once in a while for a little bit more, uh, but really what it is is the asphalt paving can't be done unless it's above zero. So uh, you can pave outside of specs, but then you need longer warranty pro periods and stuff like that. But usually that October 31st is kind of the deadline for paving. So we're pretty confident that all that work will be completed by that time. And with that, I'll open up to any questions. Yeah, I think just in general, I, I, I know that I think we've had updates in the past where we were giving timelines and, and even those timelines weren't met. So I'm just, I think to, to try and get an understanding of, is this lack of uh, material? Did they run across issues? Leung, for example, I think we expected that one to be open the first week or two of, of September and, and that's been delayed longer. Yeah. So Leung, the biggest concern was the fact that we ran into some shallow utility lines in the main bend of the north end of Leung. Uh, so we basically had to uh, wait for Fortis to come in and they were, it was actually good because they were scheduled to come in and do some other maintenance in the area. So they're able to add that to the schedule. And basically we relocated a bunch of the shallow utilities through that area so that the storm pipes that were planned for that area could go in. Um, as well as we ran into some other services that we didn't know about at the school site that we had to relocate. Uh, and then just typical things like uh, sub base under the road wasn't to the best standard. So we had to dig that out and put it back. And uh, there was some other uh, coordination issues with uh, um, the shallow utilities on the south end of the project too. And Fortis is supposed to be coming in and doing the lights in the next little bit here because we kind of have to wait for them to remove all the th the underground that are in the way and then relocate them. And then we come in afterwards and do that final. And then they come in and put the new lights up. So it's definitely kind of a three or four pronged sort of uh, approach. Well, like any renovation, right? You open up the wall, you open up the road, you find surprises. And in this case, it sounds like everything we've done, we've found a little surprise. Um, and then just sorry, before you, the, the Vista Trail, what, when they pave, will that open? Oh, yes. Do we expect that to open for the public? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Schwab? Through the chair to Director Wern, um, thanks for the updates. I'm just wondering if the schools will be updated and when the sidewalks will be open for the kids to start walking down the long road instead of having to cut through the junior campus because i know a few of them aren't taking the walking trail they're cutting through the other school so um, yeah. will we be updating the school so they can update the parents and the children yeah um stantec's been doing a really good job and so is the border paving with coordinating that so making sure that the school knows okay well we're done pouring the sidewalk we can have the kids come on here so uh, they just finished pouring yesterday so I believe that they should be, you know, informing the students of revisions to that uh, pedestrian area. But yeah, they have been kind of walking through that different field just to kind of keep them out of the way. Uh, but yeah, we've been in constant communication with uh, Wolf Creek Schools on that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And from administration, do we do we uh, need a motion to accept the uh, support for information? You can, but we don't. We don't need it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to, uh, we'll move back to 6.7. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. CPKC. So uh, I received uh, an email from CPKC yesterday. Uh, I just forwarded it to council uh, with regards to the, the holiday train schedule. So we will be receiving uh, the holiday train visit again this year on uh, December 11th. It's during the day. We're in that uh, alternate uh, schedule with CPKC in the last few years where alternating years will be the last stop versus the first stop. So it looks like this will be the first 
stop of that particular day. Um, now, with that, uh, in the past, CPKC has um, contributed to a charity of choice. In the last few years, it's been the Black Falls Food Bank Society, but they're asking if uh, if we would interested in changing that charity, uh, if we could have an answer to them by uh, October 11th. So that doesn't give us a lot of time. That was something that I was going to give council time to look into if they had issues and councilor called the, but given the timeline, I, I think uh, it's something we could have a quick discussion about tonight. <laughs> councilor Swab. I think that we've always given it to the food bank and it's a nice push just before Christmas for them to fill the hampers for our residents. Mm -hmm. So I think we should still give to the food bank. I see a lot of nods, but I'll uh, let Councillor Coulter weigh in. I was just going to say the same as Councillor Swab, um, especially like the amount of people that have gone to our food bank over the last few years, plus financially where everybody's sitting, that we have more people going there. I think that's the best okay. to you. support them. Well, and then, yeah, Councillor or uh, Deputy Mayor Sands. Yeah, no, I just wanted to quickly say I fully support that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, and I think uh, Councillor Dennis, who's, I'll let her comment first. <laughs> I was going to talk yeah. for you. There might be a few more going to the food bank because we have to pay for that delay that they gave us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll ask them for a little extra. Uh, but, you know, as Councillor Dennis had, you know, had participated to, to, in, in the uh, the fundraiser for the food bank this weekend. Uh, we can see by the turnout that this community really values the the food bank. They provide more than just food hampers in this community programming, uh, and and it's a really a broader uh, charity than than many. And it's a grassroots charity that supports people that uh, that struggle, especially as Councillor Svab pointed out at Christmas time, where. Uh, where that's essential. And I think just about any gathering that we have in the community, we try and collect food for the food bank anyways, food and money. So it does seem appropriate. I, I'm in support of that. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have another charity in mind that, uh, that maybe we thought was in greater need. I highly doubt that there's another charity in our community that, that covers as many uh, different programs and, and essential needs as the food bank does for us. So I'm happy to support that. So with that, we'll just, can we get a motion just to direct uh, that we'll be supporting the food or we'll be directing CPKC to to support the food bank, uh, Councilor Dennis. I'll make a motion for CP, <laughs> CPKC to donate their, sorry, I don't even know how to say that, to do their fundraising to the food bank. <laughs> sorry. To support. Okay. Thank you. Any debate or discussion on that motion? Oh, Councillor Coulter. Sorry, just a clarification because our food bank isn't actually called the food bank, it's called Beyond Foods. Should that be what the wording should be? Yeah, I think the food, I think their, their charitable status is still the Black Falls Food Bank Society. Yeah. So we'll have it word to support. And it's in the letter that everybody received. All right. Everyone understands the motion, at least enough to vote. All in favor? Thank you. That's unanimous. Uh, we have no notice of motion. We do have one confidential item. So uh, we'll go to recess 811. We'll be back in five minutes. And we'll go on camera. Thank you.